Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you are listening to episode number 15. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Warbritton of Midwest Whitetail. Aaron's sharing strategies for pattering mature bucks and some late season hunting tips for public land. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you are listening to episode number 15. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Warbritton of Midwest Whitetail. Super excited to have Aaron on the show. Um, Aaron comes from the Midwest Whitetail crew. Um, he's a video producer um, who's worked on a host, uh, a variety of content and shows with the uh, with Midwest Whitetail, everything from Cabela's Spring Thunder, the Great Plains Show, Cabela's Whitetail Season. He even chips in on a little bit on the uh, Chasing November content that you can find on Apple TV. TV and or YouTube. Um, Aaron's going to be sharing some tips with us today as it uh, relates to patterning mature bucks on public land and even give us a few pointers uh, for some of those late season hunts since we are kind of in that late season time period. Uh, unfortunately, Phil uh, is unable to join us today, but we will power ahead and uh, I will ride this mission solo with Aaron. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get Aaron on the line and get talking patterning mature bucks on public land. But before we get Aaron on the line, let's take a quick break to hear a word about our partners at Exodus Outdoor Gear. Today, we'll hear from Exodus customer Chris Applestad, who shares how his Exodus trail camera put him on an early season pattern of a 160-inch buck. It was neat to actually show pictures of bucks to uh, my friends, and they say, yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing you'll see them. And then all of a sudden, when the season's around, they will disappear. I'll never see those guys again. And, uh, you know, I had... The one I actually, the buck I actually shot, I had patterned and, you know, I knew generally where, where he went at what time and that's exactly where I sat. And, you know, it, it was, it was like a TV show where, except I wasn't on a farm that people managed year round, you know, it's was, it was my own little piece of property. So it was cool. And that, folks, is an Exodus experience. If you'd like to learn more about Exodus trail cameras, visit them at exodusoutdoorgear.com. And now back to the show. All right. I am joined today by Aaron Warbritton of Midwest Whitetail. Uh, Aaron is a pro staff member over there at Midwest Whitetail, and I'm super stoked to have him on the uh, on the show today. We've been playing a little bit of email tag, trying to get connected here, but uh, glad we finally made time to do so. How you doing, Aaron? Good, man. Good. How are things up there? Not too bad. You know, I know we were just chatting a little bit before we started recording that this uh, nice cold snap that's rolled through has done a lot, done some wonders for the, uh, for the deer woods. Oh, absolutely. It is, uh, it's fixing to be, uh, to break loose here in the next week or so. It's been awful cold here in Iowa where we're at, but, uh, these, uh, these first shotgun seasons get pressured pretty hard. So a lot of us wait for the, uh, late muzzleloader to come in. And then uh, obviously hitting the food sources then, but yeah, it should be, we'll be hunting really hard come next Monday for the last couple of weeks of the, of the deer season before the ATA show. So I'm hoping that a few of us here in the office can put, uh, put some bucks down yet. Nice. Yeah. I can, I can absolutely sympathize with the, uh, with, with the pressure. Pennsylvania has a pretty, uh, pretty heavy hunting heritage and, and a ton of hunters, especially when it comes to rifle season, which just wrapped up. I want to say Saturday was the last day of rifle. So I'm kind of in the same boat where I'm letting everything kind of, kind of rest and, and lie dormant until, uh, archery season for me. I don't do any, I don't do much muzzle loader hunting. I pretty much stick to stick with the stick and string, but, uh, that'll come back in for me back at our family farm here. I guess the day after Christmas, the Monday after Christmas. So I'll be, uh, I'll be back, you know, getting after it around then and got a couple nice fall food plots to try to sit over and see if we, uh, can't make something happen. I tagged out in Ohio, so we'll try to get a two for this year. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So, so I know, you know, I did a little bit of research, you know, I always like to dig into the the folks I'm going to have on again, you know, thanks for, thanks for joining, uh, the, the podcast. I, I've been looking forward to having a conversation with you, read up on you a little bit, but for those who aren't familiar with you and what you do, can you just give us a little bit of background about what you do professionally, what you do at Midwest Whitetail? Sure. Sure. I am, uh, I'm a video producer at Midwest Whitetail. Um, uh, Bill Winky is the host and owner of the company as most folks uh, know that have seen the show. And uh, I am one of five full-time employees that works for 
the Midwest Whitetail Company. Um, and uh, I'm a video producer, like I like I just mentioned. We all sort of wear different hats in in the office here. We we live and work just up the road from Bill, about five six miles away. And I produce and host the Cabela Spring Thunder Turkey Hunting Series. It's an all digital, all online series that we do for them. And then I also uh, contribute a lot of other video content myself and Bill do to the Cabela's Deer Nation site. And this is this is all underneath that same Midwest Whitetail umbrella. We do tips, tactics, um, deer videos for them, as well as several other companies around. And then um, more directly associated to hunting, I hunt primarily on public land, and we film it all for the uh, Midwest Whitetail website and show. We also have a, a, a public land video blog on the Midwest Whitetail website where we'll where we showcase our hunts each day when we come in we'll we'll bring we'll actually bring the footage in and then sit down and edit it from that day that way folks can see you know if we uh succeeded or failed and uh everything in between and sort of help people through the season on what uh trends are doing what what the deer are doing at any given time there's no no better way to do that than the than to try to show them what you saw that day so <laughs> right. that they can they can adjust their tactics and stuff from that point moving forward. Right. Yeah, the one thing I really appreciate what you guys do at, at Midwest Whitetail is the is the digital format that you guys are kind of, you know, going going forward with. I recently, you know, uh, have been using Apple TV uh, to to start to watch a lot of uh, a lot of y'all's content. Um, and the real time aspect of it, man, is is unique i think in my my opinion i mean i imagine there's a lot of work that goes into that and getting things edited down so quickly because i know i do some self-filming and i've put some stuff together just for my own personal you know purposes and um that's no easy task pulling that that footage together and you guys do it pretty quickly yeah we we usually have to produce a show oh each one of us has uh different shows that we produce each week but um uh Every week we have a new one that that comes out in the fall. Right. So that on top of those video blogs that I was mentioning before, we we come in every day and spend a couple hours editing the video blog at night, and then we spend a couple hours on our on our shows, and then obviously spend uh, all day hunting right. or filming, and just do the editing primarily at night, and then during the off season we spend our time editing our chasing November series that you probably have seen on Apple TV. Yeah. And that's our more polished, um, series. It actually took the place of our TV show. We did a TV show for several years for the sportsman's channel and we tired of that and decided that we were going to go a different direction with, uh, the chasing November show. And so far we've, uh, it's been well received. I, I think we're, we're learning as we go. So, uh, hopefully these next few years will be even better. Yeah, no, the uh, absolutely the, the the chasing November shows is is great, and I I have been kind of partaking of, the, of that in the uh, in the Apple um, TV land, um, which is really nice. It's it's nice to be able to kind of have that on on demand, and you know it's uh it's nice that folks can have it at their fingertips whenever they want it, and not necessarily have to be tied to a, a specific TV or program schedule, which is nice. I like to binge watch my things on on a, on the digital platform, yeah. so it's nice whenever you get some some rough weather and maybe you can't get outside for a couple of days, get snowed in, and there's a there's plenty of whitetail to be had on the Midwest Whitetail Channel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the one thing you know for those who are listening, like the, you know, the one thing that I think we really want to dive into today and, and pick your brain about, and you just mentioned it just a few moments ago, is your experience on on public land, and specifically, you know, I think for for me selfishly, and I think there's a lot of folks out there that probably have similar questions, is specifically when you're on public land, you know, and you're trying to go after a mature deer, you know, and you're trying to pattern a mature deer. I think. Doing it on manicured land, if you will, is, is a challenge in itself, right? And I think you kind of up the uh, the ante a little bit when you go to public land where you don't have as much control or, you know, in many times any control at all. So I guess let's just start at, at, at that point. Like if you're – when you're looking for public land to, to hunt and you want to pa- pattern a mature buck, how are you choosing your public land? Like what's the what, – what's your initial approach whenever you're going to pick a, or select a chunk of land to get after it? Well, um, like you just mentioned, um, it is quite different patterning a mature buck on public land than it is on private land. Um, uh, only in the sense that if you have private land that's unpressured, a lot of times there's private land out there that is pressured as much, if not more 
yeah. than areas of the public land. But, uh, for instance, Bill down the road has got um, his 1,000 acres or so that he hunts and manages, um, and he patterns deer using trail cameras and uh, and and patterns them early on in the season. His, his main time frame for learning about his deer and trying to kill them is in late September, right before season comes in. It is almost completely opposite for us on public land. Well, we're dealing with pressured deer and lots of hunters and also lots of acreage. Luckily, we figure out everything, I would say, uh, between now and next August. Really, when uh, when we're killing those deer, I mean, we're, we're killing bucks on public in October and November and December. But uh, that's when we're shooting them, I like to say. When we're actually killing right. them is in the late winter um, spring and early summer. That's when we're out there figuring them out. And, and the best way to, to pattern a, a buck on public land is almost a year after the fact. So what I like to do on, on public land, instead of running a bunch of trail cameras and constantly checking them and trying to keep tabs on a specific buck, we'll, we'll set up cameras in areas out there and, and hope that they don't get stolen. Unfortunately, some of them do, right. even if we lock them to the trees, that's just going to happen out there. Um, and there's some things you can do to prevent that, but, but uh, I can get into that later. What we do with our cameras is we'll run them deep in a bedding area, way back in somewhere, for the entire season. And we won't we won't even pull them until after we're done hunting. And then we'll take that intel from that year. Maybe there's a couple bucks on there showing up doing a certain thing. And then we'll go in there and scout that property really hard during the off-season in the winter shed season and in the in in the spring looking for bedding areas looking for travel routes trying to figure out where that buck was living what he was doing when he was on those cameras and then we can come back in the next year if by chance he survives and we pick him up in the summer or early season on the camera we already have a decent idea of uh, what he'd done the year prior and as you follow him you know um year to year and as they mature up to four or five and six years old you're able to sort of connect all those dots from uh, the years prior. So off-season scouting and really year-round scouting on public is the number one thing. And the one common trend that um, we've seen on public, and I've also learned from a, a friend of mine, Dan Infault, is that mature bucks on public land live in areas where people never go. Right. Um, and, and that – that sounds like that you've got to go, you know, two miles deep to the most remote spot where nobody's been in 20 years, you know, and sometimes that is the case, but other times it is that small little overlooked woodlot right next to the parking lot that people just walk right by. Uh, I always like to say 200 yards is a long way for a mature buck. Right. Um, especially if he's bedded down, you know, he can only see a short distance and, if he's got the the wind in his favor and and when you're when you're walking in he can't see or smell you he's not going to be alerted to your presence so that being said if he's 60 70 yards off of a county road for instance and you've got a parking lot you know just right there adjacent to him but you're not walking up through the area that he's bedded in he'll live there and stay there um uh, a lot of the time so basically you're looking for the overlooked spots like that or you're looking for the spots way back in where nobody else is willing to go. Because those are the two areas where there is little to no human scent, right. so where, where people don't go. Right. So when, you're, when you start doing your scouting, how much, especially you know, you know, when we're talking about public land, how much of what you're doing even before you get into the timber is based on, on maps and looking at, at, at topo maps and, and, and stuff like that? Are you guys getting into that as well to start to really kind of pinpoint areas? Because I know, you know that the public land areas you're hunting are probably tens of thousands of acres, right? And it's just, yeah. you, you could take a lifetime to try to scout all that. So how are you guys kind of narrowing down your choices before you get there? And are you? Well, that's a good question, and yes, that's the first step. Um, you've got to find um, a good resource online to uh, to scout, um, cyber scout, as we call it, and and pull up Google Earth, Google Maps. Um, Powderhook.com is a great resource. A lot of the state agencies, the DNRs and uh, conservation agencies and so forth, have 
maps on their websites that uh, actually show you property borders and boundaries and stuff. I think Onyx Maps also sells a chip system that you can put into your GPS and computer to where you can see all of the updated public land boundaries. So that's the number one thing, being able to see those boundaries so online so that you know which land you can and can't hunt, obviously. Right. Um, but uh, the next thing it, that we do when it comes to scouting is we'll check off all the areas that are easily accessible. So say, for instance, you've got one big block, it's 5,000 acres, and uh, roads are surrounding that block, and uh, there's a few trails going through it, like bike trails and, and whatever else. I'm going to go through that map. I'm going to mark all those parking lots. I'm going to I'm going to mark those trails, any like ag fields that have access trails leading straight to them. I'm going to locate all those on a map first. And I, I won't necessarily ignore those spots, but I'm not going to pay uh, attention to them firsthand. When you're scouting 5,000 acres and you're trying to find a place to hunt, uh, you want to deduce that down to uh, as small uh, of an acreage as you can before you go in to scout. Because it's impossible to scout 5,000 acres in just a couple of trips. I mean, it'd take you 10 years to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right. So you look for you look for the highest um, pressured areas. And those are, I mean, those are very predictable. People are way more predictable than deer. And deer pattern people, for sure. So uh, you look for those areas, look for those trails, and mark them off, and then you start to look for your typical terrain, you know, your funnels, your, your bedding locations, uh, your thick areas, your habitat changes, um, food sources, so on and so forth. You, I mean, you don't do anything different there from an aerial scouting standpoint that you would on private land, except for the fact that you're targeting those pressured areas first and you're basically marking them out. So back to my 5,000 acre example, if you have 5,000 acres there, we may, we may only be scouting on two or 300 acres of it right. and just going from one spot to the next until we find the, the location where no people go and the mature bucks are there most right. of the time. Yeah. It's interesting when you say, you know, 200 yards is a, is a long ways for, uh, for a mature buck, you know, cause I know just from my own personal experience, when I went to Ohio this year, I hunted, <clears throat> as I'd mentioned, we have a family farm. A lot of the hunting that I've done has been on that farm. And this was my first trip to the Buckeye state and it was public land. Uh, and it was, you know, I think there was something like in total of like 60,000 acres, or like all combined and like across the, 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 of the AEP, the AEP controls. So we, I did exactly what you were kind of saying. I found a, an area online. I checked off all the areas where I thought people would be, you know, kind of piling into anything that was close to a food source. I kind of marked off as not, not an option. And I found an area that was really steep and super brushy and just kind of nasty to get into. And my hike wasn't all that far, but it was, wasn't an easy hike. Um, and if you looked at it and you went and scouted it and you didn't pay attention, you'd probably think that, it, that there weren't going to be a lot of, you know, great deer activity there. But I kind of looked at it as the place where no one else was willing to go and had exactly kind of happen what you're talking about, where it's like I had, had great action and, and, and took a nice, you know, nice deer in that area with those, with those similar tips. Yeah. Yeah. And it's intimidating. A lot of folks will look at, I mean, we hunt probably 30 some thousand acres total mm -hmm. and, um, we may have 60 or 70 different trees picked for stand locations before the season comes in. And then you sort of just, uh, run cameras and scout and look for buck sign and, and, and tracks and that sort of thing, trying to, to pin down, some mature bucks because it always changes that's the one thing that you that you have on public um that you don't have on private manicured land is that you can set up those sanctuaries on private land to you know basically hold a mature buck in them every year if there's a mature buck in the area you know he's probably going to be in there now those do exist on public land but they're uh, few and far between because pressure will change food sources obviously change everywhere but pressure will definitely change um uh, year to year to year in there i mean all it takes is is one big group in shotgun season to walk through there and uh and to really bump all the deer around and get them and get them budgie to uh to sort of change their patterns in that area they've got to adapt all the time and like i said before those deer will pattern people but it, they may not move very far a lot and that's another misconception people have is when they spook deer on public 
they think, you know, well, they're a wary public land buck. They're gone. We're never going to see them again. A lot of times they just, they just move over the ridge and set up camp. You know, they're used to seeing that. They're used to seeing people out there. They're used to being harassed. So they're, they're constantly on their guard, which makes them tough to get within bow range, but they live there. You know, they're, right. they're used to that and they know how to dodge that pressure. Right. So, you know, so we, we've gone through now and, you know, we've kind of located our, our piece of land and, you know, we know that there's areas that, are, that potentially couldn't be, you know, too far away from a, a road or whatever the case might be that could, you know, where a mature buck could be living. But, you know, for you, whenever you're looking at a chunk of land and say you've narrowed it down to the, you know, a couple hundred acres that you want to focus on, on a, you know, in an area, are there particular land features that you really that you really like to dial in on? Like, are, are there are there ridges that you like to dial in on? Or is it is it, it kind of like brushy creek bottoms or river bottoms that you, that you like that you prefer to kind of go after? Can you talk a little bit about land features and how that plays into your overall public land strategy? Uh, yeah, it all kind of depends on the type of terrain that you're hunting. The number one thing that we look for is bedding areas, and that's what we hunt all the time is bedding areas we food sources are are secondary on public it's all about where they live um during the daytime you got to be close to them and and really that's sort of my philosophy on i wouldn't just call it public land hunting i would say that's my philosophy on on hunting anywhere which will differ a lot from some people we're pretty aggressive hunters we like to be if if we can be within a couple hundred yards or less of where that buck is bedded, we're going to be in better shape because I feel like you can catch a lot more of them up moving during the day that way. And, uh, and they're much more predictable if you can get right in there right next to them. That being said, each one of these areas is going to offer slightly different terrain. So the bedding cover is going to differ in ridges, for example, like open woods, um, hillier terrain, they're going to, uh, they're going to tend to bed either down in the bottom of those steep, nasty ditches, or they're going to bed off of those, the points of those ridges a lot of the time with wind to back watching downwind down below them. Um, and then like you just mentioned, brushy creek bottoms, river bottoms, that sort of thing are, are excellent areas as well. Those oxbows and those rivers are perfect places for big bucks to bed because it offers them a great escape route. Usually they can just hop down in the creek or the river or whatever and be out of sight, out of mind, away from a predator and uh, just like that. And uh, those oxbows set up well for wind direction as well because they know that uh, no no predator is going to come from the water side in most cases. Right. You know, a coyote or a wolf or anything like that is not going to cross that to get to them. Most of the time they're going to come from the land side. So the deer can can sit there with the wind blowing into them and smell any predators coming in from land and then uh, be able to watch that open creek bottom back behind them that's that's another misconception i think folks have is whenever it comes to bedding areas they want to find the thickest nastiest stuff and, and it's good but that big buck may not always be right in the middle of that <laughs> a lot of times he'll be he'll be on the edge of it you know, wind blowing out of the thick cover, he'll be on the edge of it, watching all that open, and uh, you may never even see him. You know, you may walk up there and bump some does and little bucks or whatever, and never even know that a big buck was laying there watching you walk up the ridge to him. Yeah. You know, that, so, so that's really what we're looking for constantly is bedding areas, and I mean, we could we could spend an entire podcast talking just about <laughs> bedding areas and different and different terrains and that sort of thing. But once you locate those bedding area terrain types within or habitat types within your specific terrain, that's where you're going to, that's where you're going to find the big boys at on public. That's where we like to target anyway. Right. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned, you know, sometimes they might lay, you know, relatively out in, out in the open. It's, I, I took my daughter this year on a, on a squirrel hunt, her first hunt. And it was, uh, it was during archery season. I hunted the morning and, and climbed out of my stand to take her on a squirrel hunt that I promised her. And uh, we ended up seeing a nice, you know, for Pennsylvania, it was a nice eight point. And unfortunately, I didn't have my bow with me, which would have been an awesome experience for her to kind of be there while I harvest a harvest a, a nice buck in PA. But uh, anyway, long story short, we were kind of walking back through the woods and we were walking down this ridge side in wide open timber. And there, lo and behold, up against a, a down log was a buck bed. You know, and it just seemed like the yep. oddest place to be because, I mean, he was sticking out like a sore thumb. But to your point, he could see all the way down to that ridge bottom because it was wide open. 
and he could smell anything coming from behind him. So he was set up pretty bulletproof in that area. Yep. You know it when you find him. Yeah. When you find the when you find that buck's hole, his bedding, his bed, his bedding area, you know it because yep. you can sit down in that bed and uh, you can sort of try to get inside his head and think about what wind direction he's laying there on, what he can see, what he can smell, which areas it's connected to, you know, what, whether he's got acorns on one exit trail and, and corn on another or a food plot on one, doe bedding area on another, so on and so forth. So everything everything's always related to bedding for us. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny when you when you when you can get yourself in kind of that mindset and in, in, you know not to say that you ever really begin to think as they do because I think they're a lot smarter than we are. But it's funny when it, you know, just as you mentioned, if you get down to that bed and you kind of look and you can just kind of see what he sees, um, it kind of opens your eyes a little bit to the woods, you know, and, and and what he's encountering and why he's set up in places that he's setting up. You know, I think that's a good that's a good point. So after you guys, you know, after you've been scouting, you've, you've found like your bedding areas and so on and so forth, you know, during, uh, during the, I know you were mentioned that you like to get in in the winter and, and, and uh, 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 early spring. Are you paying attention when you get back in there in the fall? Are you, how much, I guess, let me ask it this way. How much does hot sign play into where you're going to ultimately set up a stand location versus inventory or prior year knowledge that you have? How much does hot sign play into that? Well, um, in most situations, we're going in areas that we have previously scouted. So if we see, for example, a rub line or a bunch of scrapes or something at the tip of a bedding area close to one of those trees that we're wanting to hunt, we're going to be pretty optimistic for that spot because we know that a, a buck of some size has been using that particular bedding area often. Now, a lot of folks, I mean, here in Iowa, we got, we got a lot of bucks. Um, we got a lot of deer period and right. the public land hunting, hunting is good. So, uh, they leave a lot of sign, even the year and a half, two and a half year old bucks. I mean, heck, they probably leave more sign than the mature bucks do. Right. So you really got to be able to determine, um, the best kind of sign to be reading. And most folks look at rubs and when we do that, and scrapes um but another thing that that i've started doing more this year and paying attention to is tracks and that that is probably the most important sign that a big buck leaves for you to look at Uh, a huge track can only mean one thing and obviously you need to be able to to check out that track and be able to tell if it's sliding in the mud or if it's you know, good hard ground, flat surface if the deer's running, if it's walking. But if you find a good flat spot, for example, that's got fairly good consistent soil, and you can tell that that deer is is walking by looking at the track, and you can if you look at enough of them, you'll be able to start measuring those tracks, you know. And, And I promise you, you can tell a big difference between you know, a four or five year old buck's track in most situations than you can with a, uh, a young buck or a doe, you know, just, just by the way, those tracks set up and, and, and they're all different. I mean, they're, as you, as you know, I'm sure you can look at one mature buck that's five years old, that's huge bodied with tiny antlers. And the next one has a small body with huge antlers, you know, same goes for tracks. So they're, they're not all created equal, but for the most part, mature bucks leave big tracks. So that's the, that's the best sign that we can look for. Nice. Yeah, it's funny because you're, 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 this is probably the third conversation just in, in the past month that I've had with folks uh, just in different forums, you know, whether it was, you know, hanging around deer camp or whatever, talking about using tracks. Um, it was one of those yeah. things where I think, you know, oftentimes with as much technology as we get accustomed to using in the deer woods these days, I think sometimes we – forget some of the original woodsmanship, you know, uh, that we, that we were kind of brought up on. And, uh, it's funny how those things still kind of ring true. But when you're, when you're talking about cutting a track, is there just from your own personal experience, is there a size like in, in inches that you're kind of looking for that's going to trip your trigger? You know, is it so many inches and you're like, okay, this is, this is something I want to pay attention to versus, versus not. Yeah. Uh, my buddy, Joe Elzinger, who is, uh, who's a really good, uh, public land hunter from up the north northeast iowa he he'll kick me for this one but uh, (laughs) 
I, uh, I, because he's got huge hands anyway. Right. Um, we always talk about the uh, three finger track rule. And if you can lay, if you can lay your three fingers inside of a buck track or inside of a deer track, pretty good chance. It's a fairly sizable buck, you know, and, Joe, and the reason why Joe always, you know, why he would, uh, wouldn't agree with me there is because he's got big hands, you know, I mean, right. a three finger track for him is probably an elk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's a good rule. Um, is three finger track. And uh, another thing that we pay more attention to, I'd say than just that rule is find that track in an area where there's other tracks and compare them. Well, that's a good point. And uh, even take a picture of them. Uh, we we've, we've always got a video camera with us, so we're filming them all the time. You know, if you if you cross a trail, you know, at the bottom of a creek or whatever, and that sand where it's nice and flat and consistent down there, and look at all the tracks around, and then when you find that big track, you're gonna know it. I mean, there'll be one set of big tracks maybe there compared to all the rest of them, and they're gonna stand out because they're way bigger. Right. Another thing is they're they're going to be further apart because a mature buck will take longer strides as he's walking than the rest of them will. Right. Interesting. That's, so those are both things to look for. I actually, I took a nice buck this year on public um, towards the end of October down here that we'd never seen before. But uh, Sean and I had been hunting in there the week prior. And when we, were, when we were going in to hunt that day, we basically made a loop around the creek just scouting four tracks. In about 75, 80 yards from where I killed that buck, we found several sets of huge buck tracks. Wow. So we knew that there was a big one up in there. Then we got up in there and did more scouting and found some big rubs and that sort of thing. We knew there was a mature buck in there, and then we sort of narrowed down where we thought he was bedding based on our aerial scouting and went in from there. So it's it's not just one thing. you know, It's a combination of, of multiple things, but tracks can definitely pay off. Right. That's a great tool. Nice. So uh, let me ask you, I'm, I'm interested in, in this answer in, in two different ways, public versus um, private land. So you've done all your scouting and insane in both instances, you've done your scouting and you think you kind of know you got a, you got a big boy kind of narrowed down where you think he's, he might be living and and say maybe you even have a little bit of history with him. How much history are you really looking to have with a buck before you're going to feel confident that you're able to put a pattern on him? Oh, that's, that's hard to say. Um, it all, all depends on the personality of the buck. Right. Um, usually it's probably going to take a couple of years. Uh, but it, it all depends on that, that deer. I mean, some of them we can kill that same season. You know, if we, if we find a big one that's uh, four or five years old that we've never seen before, we can kill them that year. Um, if, we can uh, we can spot him a few times through observation sits or trail camera photos or whatever, and then narrow down where he's bedding. That's really the the biggest thing, and that and that's one thing that is a common denominator across the board. Mature bucks will bed in like-minded places year after year. So, if you find a a big deer that you're that you're wanting to kill, you got to narrow down where the mature buck bedding areas are on that on that piece of property in my opinion um you can you can do it with cameras and stuff on private land or in in several years of running cameras but that's just one small piece we we probably learn more via our scouting and observation sets than we do even running trail cameras and we'll observe uh, a buck and it may take you know i mean it may take several years i mean i've got buck that i was hunting this year that I've been hunting for uh, three years now, myself and the other guys in the office have. And we got close to killing them a couple of times this year, but never did it. And this was the first year that we've really been in the game on it. And it's it's just taken us that long to sort of narrow down where he, he and other mature bucks bed on this particular property. But, uh, but like I mentioned before, it, it all depends on the personality of the deer. I don't, I won't get too much into the uh, the daylight and the nocturnal part of it because uh, lots of guys do talk about that, and it does have a lot of weight to it. But to be honest, that I I feel like all mature bucks they move in some capacity during daylight. 
And that's something that you don't you don't hear very often. But if you narrow down where they're betting, they just don't they, they just spend a lot of their time being lethargic and not going anywhere fast and not getting in a hurry to do anything. Where where they're usually betting at is in locations where they've got food, water, cover, everything there that they need. So a lot of folks um, deduce that as them being nocturnal in October because they've got. They've got their trail camera set up, you know, over a food plot or over a trail close to a food source or something like that, and they're only picking up these deer in the middle of the night. Well, that deer may only be bedding three or 400 yards from that spot, but if if he's got browse and acorns and uh, cover and water and stuff real close to where that, where that bedding location is, he's not going to get up there until the middle of the night. You know, I mean, he has, he has nothing to, to force him up there. Uh, uh, because there's no does or anything in heat. I mean, in, in fact, this year we narrowed down one of those buck bedding areas in early October, and we watched on the 7th of October when it was 60 degrees, we, we saw four mature bucks, and they were all up. A lot of them were up moving a good hour before dark. But if you watch them, they only get about 60 or 70 yards from that initial bed. We were watching them stand up out of their bedding, you know, so that's really, I'm going to come back to that again here as far as patterning bucks. Um, I think it, I feel like it all starts with those buck bedding areas. And then after that, you can sort of put your cameras in and around those. You, you find the buck bedding areas and then you look at, look for trails and possible food sources, doe bedding areas around those, and then try to intercept them um, going to and from, you know, A to B. And once you do you can start to narrow down their preferred bedding areas on a specific property. I mean, a lot of them are going to have five, six, seven, eight, countless numbers of bedding areas on a property, but the more the more intel you gather, the better grasp that you're going to have. Right. Um, and, the, and the older that they get, the more predictable they are. Right, and they probably even squeeze down their, their home range even further, I'd imagine, as they get older. Sure. So they yep. right. So you, you'd mentioned October there uh, for, for a moment, and that was kind of triggered a, a question or, or a thought, rather. So is there a particular time, I guess, of year that you find that you're, that you're more likely to be able to work a pattern versus a, a worse time? You know, I, you know, I know during a rut, it's, you know, I like to say it all kind of breaks loose. And, you know, I've heard guys say that they, you know, they can pattern a deer, you know, or a buck during, during the rut. And I've heard other guys say that you're really never going to pattern a buck during, during the rut. They're just kind of moving wherever they're finding hot does. And just, it's kind of a, a luck of the draw. So have you, do you have a specific time of year that you like to focus on if you are going to pattern a specific buck? Uh, not really. I think it all depends on, on a number of factors. Um, there's just no way for me to be able to give a cut and dry answer there. Right. Um, because, uh, it just, I mean, hunter, hunting pressure, the amount of does that you got in the area, the buck to doe ratio, the age class of bucks that you've got, um, is all going to determine how much they move in the rut <clears throat> and, uh, in other times of the year as well. You know, if there's one big buck in there and not very many other younger ones and several does around with, with ample food. I wouldn't be surprised if that old buck doesn't move anywhere all year. He lives right there. Um, it does seem to be, though, for us on public anyway, in our situation, we don't have a ton of success in early November. The first, you know, the third, the fourth, through the eighth and ninth, we don't do very very good. Um, seems like we're, we're killing bucks in October and uh, let late November, mid to late November. And as far as patterning them goes, mm, yeah, that's a tough one. I would, I would say it's easiest to do that in October if I had to pick one, but, um, I, I definitely think that you can, you can do that in, in late November, um, as well. And, and the best time to do it is probably late October. So do you think so that November time frame of October, do you think that November time frame you were just mentioning where, you know, you guys have had you, you, the, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, your least amount of success is due to, is correlated in any way to the amount of hunting pressure that kind of starts to ramp up during that time of year guys knowing that, you know, 
pre rut and rut is really kind of starting to to take effect. So a lot more folks are in the woods. Oh, yeah. Yep, without a doubt. And that's when most folks we're on in Iowa, and that's when most uh, folks take their vacation. Right. As we know, I mean, a lot of them will take their ten day vacation the first ten days in November. Right. So when people start hitting the woods. Granted, most of them know what they're doing, and they're not, um, you know, bumping around like uh, like folks do during gun season and doing deer drives and that sort of thing. They're going in with stands on their back or whatever and trying to be sneaky and not, not booger the deer up too bad, but it doesn't take much. And we definitely see that mature buck movement drop off. It, it it's sort of It's sort of on an upswing for the entire month of October until the very end first couple of days in november can be pretty good but then it drops off and you don't see much out of them for for the next week or so until the middle part of the rut and that's also when the pressure starts to slide back off again right right so you know, with that being said you know there's you know especially on, on public land it's like you really kind of have to pick your pick your battles <laughs> i guess is is, is one way yep. one way to put it you know you have to understand what other folks are doing and how that's going to impact what you're what you're trying to accomplish so with that you know do you find yourself being more aggressive or how do you how do you gauge when to be aggressive and kind of really move in tight on that buck bedding area versus to play it cool and kind of hang back a little bit knowing that you know you really have windows of opportunity not just with the the animal itself but also windows of opportunity whenever you're talking about other folks hitting the timber and when the pressure really starts to ramp up yeah yeah and that's a good question we're we're pretty aggressive most of the time but um it's it is calculated like you just said uh what we'll do leading up to hunting season is we'll run a lot of cameras but we're not as we're not looking for deer as much as we are people Right, and I'll I'll even check some cameras throughout the season, but those cameras are usually located very close to parking lots. Um, they're on major trails that are leading into food sources that that everybody can see that we'll be hunting over <clears throat> um, over them. But then you'll get the occasional nighttime picture of a big buck in those spots. But what we're looking for more than anything is honey pressure, and once we find once we pull a camera that doesn't have anybody on it usually there's some big bucks on it because there's no hunting pressure in that <laughs> right. area and that and like i said before that will change year to year so that's something to keep an eye on but uh as far as us picking our time to go in after a specific buck or on a specific spot we like to do observation sits if we if we've previously scouted the area we'll go in there if possible and do an observation sit from a distance to see if we can get eyes on the deer. And the observation sit, you know, you could easily kill them on that sit. Right. You know, you may only be 100 yards from the tree that you need to be in. But if you can see them doing one thing and then slide out of there and not not booger them up, which is way easier to do if you're 100 yards from, from their bed than if you're 50 yards from it, you know. If you can see them doing one thing one day under a specific wind direction or certain set of conditions, then you can plan for your next hunt and get back in there on. But we don't, we are definitely more aggressive than most. Uh, we don't sit around and wait for daylight patterns necessarily, anything like that. I want to, if I, if we get eyes on a buck that uh, is using a specific bedding area, we go in there and hunt him immediately. It doesn't matter if it's early October or if it's middle of November um, because it, it's too much can change out there in, in just a matter of a few days. I mean, somebody could go walking their dog through the woods for, <laughs> you know, for a Sunday afternoon and bump the deer out of there and then you've got to start over. Right, right. So when, when you're talking about observation sets, you know, because – it's, I know a lot of folks, you know, that, that I talk to, they do a lot of that whenever they're hunting private ground. And I feel like a lot of folks are a lot more aggressive when they're on, when they're on public, just for a lot of the reasons that you pointed out. So when you're on, yep. when you're on public, what, and I don't, you know, not necessarily an exact ratio, but what do you think your number of observation sits, you know, quote unquote observation sits to hunting sits is whenever you're hunting public ground after a specific buck? Probably 50%. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, but it uh, it just depends on the area. 
um, if some of these some of these spots that we hunt are conducive to observation sets where you can get up 25 feet in a tree and you can see out over a big swamp or you know a, a river bottom that's all overgrown and nasty um, and you can get a look at one getting out of his bedroom you know from three or four hundred yards away now if you're in thick nasty timber you can't do that so you really got to rely on that prior scouting right. um, in those spots. That's the that's the main thing. And then what we do is we go in, like I'd mentioned before, and we'll look for we'll look for staging area signs, sort of just outside of that bedding area. We'll look for big rubs, big tracks, scrapes, that sort of thing. And if all that sign is there, and there's no human sign in there, then we know that that's going to be a spot we need to try. And then, you know, on the next best win, we're going to try it immediately. But we're, we're very cautious when it, when it comes to doing our in-season scouting like that. Most of the time, we will plan to hunt that spot that day that we're going in to scout. Say, for instance, we have one of those thick areas where you can't observe. We may, we may pick that spot on the map for that day and say, well, we're going to go here as plan A. If the sign is there, if the scrapes are opened up, if we find some big tracks and we know there's a big one using that area, we're going to hunt it today. Right. Um, because you don't want to scout it, leave scent, and then plan to come back a week later. That's not going to work. He's going to smell you've been there, and he's going to alter his patterns. So you've got to get you've got to get on it immediately. But many times you get there, and the the human signs there, and the big bucks aren't, or the big bucks just aren't. So you've got to have a plan B, C, D on down the, on down the road. And that's another good tip on public is don't, it, I, I want to hunt one specific deer a lot of the time, but it's very difficult to do that. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done because we do it, but, uh, uh, I just find more enjoyment in being able to bounce around and sort of adventure onto lots of different areas and lots of different situations, hunting lots of different bucks more bucks we can hunt the better in my opinion <laughs> yeah i, I 100 percent agree with you on on that the more action the uh the the more fun and the uh you know it's kind of the it's the it's the uh the buck drug that kind of keeps us coming back year after year and and spending all that time in the timber so the one you mentioned observation sets right and i think for me and i don't know if you know other folks out there listening feel similarly but you know it i want to ask you i guess this way whenever you're preparing for these type of public land hunts and you know you're going in and you, and you have some knowns right because you're doing your scouting and stuff like that but to your point it's it's not manicured and and taking care of land necessarily and set up you know to where you can kind of you know predict things because you've set a bedding area here with a food you know source here and they should travel from a to b and within this time frame and especially doing observation sits you know knowing that 50 percent of your hunts likely have a high likelihood of not having a shot opportunity and you're going into it knowing that because that's what the purpose of the sit was for. So, you know, the, over the course of a season, that can really be kind of a mental grind of going in, knowing that, you know, I'm going to go and just kind of put in my time and watch. How do you guys prepare and you specifically prepare for that mental grind of the, of the entire season? If, especially if you're not, if you don't get it done early and you're getting into the late season, how do you kind of prepare yourself for that mental grind of, of several months of getting, getting after it, knowing that you're going to have some days where, you're going to purposefully kind of set yourself up to not have a shot opportunity to gain some intel. Well, um, we fortunately are able to see lots of, lots of, uh, mature bucks throughout the year because there's a, there's a big group of us that hunt public. So we've constantly got intel coming in. Um, just about every day somebody is out there sitting somewhere and I think there was a question on whitetail watch not long ago. It asked, it asked the majority of us, you know, what is your percentage of sits versus mature buck sightings? Right. I think ours, we figured it up is about one mature buck every four or five sits. So, which is, which is fairly high. And the reason being is because we are very aggressive. We may sit that observation stand, but as soon as we see what we need to see, whether it's a doe group that is bedding in one specific spot, that we're going to target, you know, in the, uh, early rut, late rut time frame, or it's a mature buck that we actually visibly watch get up out of there. We don't waste any time. We go in for the kill next time, usually with stands on our backs. Mm -hmm. So 
that being said, we it's, it's a high risk, high reward type style of hunting. You're you're very low risk when you're when you're sitting on observation stand and you got your bow up there. But as soon as you see that buck get up out of there and come out of that area where you're looking at, you're going in after him the next time. And and that's a it's actually probably not as big of a grind for us as it would be for somebody like my boss, Bill, who, who hunts a couple of specific deer every year. But the way Bill will do it is he'll find a specific buck and then he'll hunt stands around the edges of his range until he eventually kills him. Right. You know, he may hunt, he may hunt the same stand 10, 15 times. We never hunt, hardly ever hunt the same tree more than once. Wow. And we're always packing in. So when we're going in for the kill, we're super pumped. You know, we're optimistic. Right. Because if we don't bump that thing, there's a pretty good chance we're going to see him that night. Right. You know, I mean, we're giving ourselves a one in three, one in four chance of getting a shot at that deer. Now, it's it's like I've mentioned before, it's, it's riskier because if you bump him out of the country, then you're done. You've got to start over. But that also is is uh why we hunt so much public land and we've got all these different areas with lots of different mature bucks so if we burn one up he's no worse for the wear you come in there and you can hunt him again in a couple weeks but for the time being you know you struck out there it's time to move on to the next spot right nice so how much you know how i always like to ask this question with with hunters because i think it's you know i've seen it it's kind of 50 50 on how, how folks answer this but how much do you use the moon whenever you're planning planning your hunts, and 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 how much do you kind of buy into the to the to the theory of the moon and deer movement? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm not I'm not educated enough on the subject to be able to to make any any real claims or anything. Um, I think it does bear some weight to like feeding times and that and that sort of thing, right. but. Uh, I just, uh, let's just put it this way. We got, we got enough stuff to worry about than, uh, than worrying about the moon in most situations. Uh, right. Um, when we're going out hunting. Yeah. Uh, I do think that there's, there's definitely something to be learned from it. And there's guys that have lots of success doing it. I'm not going to knock it. It's just not in our repertoire yet because we don't, we just don't know enough about it. I mean, we, we look at it on occasion but uh for the most part we are we're worried about our about our scouting and the weather more than we are the moon right that's interesting you meant you mentioned weather so you know what type of what type of things are you looking for specifically in the weather that's going to tell you to be to be in a tree are there are there specific types of weather patterns you're you're specifically looking for in you know with public land versus versus private land um, probably nothing different than what you would have on private land. I mean, when you have a cold snap come through, especially if you've, if you've got a bunch of stagnant weather that's stacked up several days in a row, say you got a week's worth of hot weather, it's humid, and it's, you know, real average out. And then all of a sudden you've got 30 mile per hour winds one night and the temperature's 20 degrees cooler the next day. Mm-hmm. Those first couple of days, you know, during that front, in the, the day or two after when that pressure barometric pressure is real high and the temperature is down, those are going to be your best movement days. And we definitely target those all year, you know, especially in October. Right. But, uh, another thing I will mention is that most of the time we are, we're associating our spots with those bedding areas. And even on warmer average days, if you pin down where he's at, where he's living at, um, he's still going to move in daylight to some extent. You know, if if you can only get within, if you can only get a couple hundred yards away from that bedding area, you need to wait for one of those cold front situations that's going to get the deer up moving a little bit earlier, you know. But if you've got a, a spot where you can sneak in and get, 50, 60 yards away from that bedding area without spooking any deer, say for an afternoon hunt, and the winds are fairly high, even if it's warm. Uh, There's a lot of days that are really warm with high south winds that can be great days to kill a mature buck because those high winds allow you to get in there and get really tight to that spot. Right. 
if you're if you're able to do that, even if it's warm, they'll still move a certain amount in in daylight. I feel on the warm days versus the cold days. You just want to hunt. You just want to hunt those spots that uh, maybe your better spots or your or your spots where you can't quite get as close as you would prefer to the bedding right. on those uh, those front days. Right. And so mentioning the wind there, do you? When, when you're using the wind, are you one of the one of the guys who, who never wants to give up the wind to the deer, or do you feel that you have to give the deer the wind to a certain degree to make him feel comfortable to move in that direction? Uh, um, kind of depends. Depends on the depends on the situation and and how the bedding is set up. Right. Uh, uh a lot of people will hunt a wind, you know in between bedding and food with the wind coming straight out of the bedding area and not really understand how those bucks are using the wind to their advantage in the bedding area. You know, and they may be hunting it there on the perfect wind for them, but that mature buck may not be bedding there that day because the wind is not in his favor to bed there. I don't think, I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, how mature bucks move in relation to the wind Mm-hmm. I haven't really been able to make any conclusions on that just yet. Yeah, um, I've cause seen I've seen them move wind to back, you know, crosswind <laughs> wind in their face, every, yeah. every which way. But the only thing that I will say is that they definitely bed with the wind to their advantage a lot of the time. And sometimes if they're bedding in a specific spot with the wind to their advantage, they're going to use a certain food source out of that bedding location. So right. you can sort of narrow that down. It just, it just depends. You never want to have your wind obviously blown into the deer's bed, but right. if you're set up just off wind, for example, and it's blow, it's blowing forty yards from him, you're still all right as long as he's not going to get downwind of you. And sometimes you have to take that risk right. to hunt a buck a buck in his bedding area like that. Right, that's a good point. I guess it depends to your point whether you're you know maybe if you're hunting hunting the his bedding area or if you're hunting a travel corridor coming from his bedding area he's probably going to use the wind differently for travel versus bedding um so i think it's a good point cuz i know this year i saw some for the first time actually saw some tailwinding um which i had never seen that before and i've talked to a, a, a few folks you know one guy that i had on as a as a guest and he hunts predominantly mountain areas and you know his philosophy on the wind is is he doesn't he doesn't care what the wind direction is. He's like on a mountain, you know, it's going to be, it's going to hit you in the face and then in the back of the head at the same time. So <laughs> trying to predict yep. it is, 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 uh, is pointless. So he's just like, I try to get tight on my scent control and just hope that I'm good enough on my scent control that whenever he's 20 yards away, he thinks I'm 150 yards away. You know, that's kind of, uh, his approach. And I, I think that I probably prescribed more to that approach than, than anything else. But it brings me to another point that I wanted to ask you is, is, is scent control. I'm always interested to see what guys do to kind of, you know, to combat their, their, their scent when they're, when they're in the timber. So if you wouldn't mind, just give us a rundown of, uh, of what you do from a scent control perspective before a hunt. <laughs> well, this is, uh, is this, is this gonna going be? to be, this is going to be what uh, most people do not want to hear, I would say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I've i hunted since I was a little kid, and um, since that time I've tried a lot of things um, in the scent control realm. And the only thing that I can say that I've got any confidence in at this point and us as a group is that Ozonics machine. Nice. Yeah. Um, I actually just talked to Buddy, they, Buddy the uh, like two days ago. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Buddy's a great guy. Yeah. And and the Ozonics machine does work. Um, I'm not going to say that it's a magic product and it works every time, all the time, but it definitely helps. I mean, there's there's been situations where we've had deer straight downwind that can't smell you because of that thing. Now, on the the flip side. A lot of folks go through pretty extraordinary measures to try to keep themselves as scent free as possible. And this has been, this has been the first year that I have basically given up on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done it all. I've, I've done it every year prior to this, to some extent, you know, keeping your clothes clean, 
and uh, transport them to the field, putting them on in the field, boots, the whole nine yards. And this year, I just finally said, nope. I'm not I'm not messing with it anymore <laughs> just because it's I want to be I'm I'm more worried about what that wind is doing than I am about my scent control. I am worried about ground scent to a certain degree. Right. Uh you know, but I'm more so trying to take a path into a stand where I'm not going to be crossing trails and that sort of thing to uh, be leaving ground scent. And and sometimes in in some situations deer aren't affected by it. Uh, sometimes they are, right. I've, I've seen them. I mean, I've done everything that you could, that you could think of, imagine of to eliminate ground scent and have a, a buck smell where I walked, right. you know, and then I've walked in there with a pair of tennis shoes on that I was wearing a basketball last week and they walk right over your tracks. So I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to answer that one, you know, well, I'll let's just say that, right. but the, the Ozonics does, the Ozonics does work. And, uh, and it definitely can help keep you from getting winded. But the the one thing that people need to pay more attention to, I believe, is the wind. Right. And right. they need to learn more about how to read wind and thermals and, and different types of terrain. I've, Dan Infault got me turned on to using milkweed in the tree stand not long ago. And that thing, that tool is bar none the best thing that you can use for for judging wind. There was there were some mornings a lot a lot of folks talk about how they don't like hunting light and variable wind mornings because they uh, they don't get a consistent wind flow but if it's if it's cold out and you're in the right situation on a light and variable wind type of a morning the first two hours of the morning those deer around your stand if you get in the right spot may not even be able to smell you because your wind is going up those thermals are pushing it you know. And I learned that this year hunting one of uh, a, a stand that I've I've that I've put it in five different trees on this ridge, and finally this year I, I put it in a, a tree on the side of this hill, and I got about 25 feet up in it, and that was the main thing I wanted to do that morning was was drop milkweed and check wind. You know, it was light and variable, one two miles an hour, and we had deer 360 degrees around us for the first two hours of the morning and nothing ever smelled us once. And we were wearing, I mean, I put my clothes on at my house that morning, warm in the truck out there. And, uh, same with the boots, whole nine yards. So did the cameraman. And that just goes to show you, if you, if you're cognizant of what that wind is doing all the time and how it can affect your scent, it's going to help you pick the better tree and pick the better spot to not get winded. Right. It's funny that you mentioned Dan's name just because I actually read an article right before I was going to Ohio and it was something similar to what you what you had just said. And it was really the reason why I picked the tree that I picked or one of the reasons why I picked the tree I picked. And I had the exact same experience that you were just talking about where I had deer all around my tree stand, especially in the morning. Um, and I was yep. set up on this leeward side of this ridge and uh yep. And I was bulletproof in that place. I had deer underneath my tree stand. I could listen to them crunching on a green briar. It was just, I didn't have, and I never had, had seen that before. Never had experienced something, you know, that close necessarily where I was like, man, I should totally be getting busted right now. And there's just no way they're like, I'm just, they have no clue that I'm here. I was, it was like, I was in a sniper's perch. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's a spot where, if there's a spot where we've got like that, where we got to hunt that just off wind or we're worried about swirling or something like that. I mean, that's great applications for that ozonics. Right. Um, and, and that's one thing when we're going, you need, people need to make sure they're using them correctly. Uh, because if you've got two people in the tree, for instance, you need to probably have two ozonics machines up there to combat the amount of human odor that you're sending downwind. Right. And, and using them, using them correctly. But those things, as far as scent control goes, I'd say that's the only thing right now going out there that I would, that I would lend much weight into. But, right. you know, I mean, everybody, everybody has opinions and does things their own way. So, right. So, you know, I know we've been, I've, I've kept you for about an hour now and I want to be sensitive to your time. So I really just have two, two last kind of questions that I want to, want to, want to ask you. And one is more time specific now that we're kind of headed into late season. So, if you were to give someone, you know, three tips 
to take into consideration as they're preparing for a late season hunt on public land for a specific mature deer, or they were planning maybe next year, you know, and they go through their year next year and they don't get it done till late season. What are those three tips to kind of, to, to kind of get them started that you would say that they should follow? Mm -hmm. I would say look for, um, overlooked food sources in an area. Maybe that like honey locust pods. Um, maybe it's, you know, browse in a swamp anything that is back closer towards those core bedding areas where those bucks will be moving during daylight because that's that's the one thing that just doesn't seem to change um especially after gun season rolls through here every every accessible point on public land has been walked through up to up to now so those bucks are really confident in those those super thick bedding areas Another thing, the, the second thing I would say would be don't necessarily just target food on public. If there's a really good food source on private land surrounding public, try to identify where the bedding area is on public and then kill those deer coming back to it in the morning. And that's something that uh, you don't hear much during the late season is uh, most people just hunt in the evenings. But if, if you've got a an awesome food source on private land, for instance, that the deer are hitting in, in the evenings, but they're betting on public. It's sometimes a better idea just to get in there and hunt them in the mornings when they come back to that betting area. Just, just wait for your chance and go in there and it's going to be cold. But I mean, the guys just this last week actually hunted a betting area two days ago, um, first thing in the morning and they saw seven or eight bucks and 10, 15 does coming in there. So that that would be the the other thing, and uh, and the last thing would be to scout continuously. Um, if you if you go in to one of those sensitive spots and you're going to hunt it one and done, I would make sure that you get everything out of it, every ounce of intel out of it that you can, because you're constantly planning for next year. And right now is the, is the best time to probably scout all year because the sign is still pretty fresh from the rut. Um, a lot of the people sign has been laid down. So if you find a spot right now that, that people haven't been in, that has tons of fresh signs from the rut, even, even if there's not a mature buck in that area, that's going to get you well ahead for next year. Right. Nice. Yeah. There's some, uh, great tips. I think a lot of times folks kind of forget about that, uh, private land, uh, food sources that are, uh, adjacent to the, uh, to, to public land. I think those are kind of overlooked little, little honey holes at, at, at times, which could be, uh, killer spots and you're right it's the most of the tips that you hear for a late season is all about you know just give up the morning don't even worry about sitting in the morning but that's a that's a great point to make especially when you're hunting public land away how to get after it in the using the morning to do so so before i let you get going i like to kind of always wrap things up with uh with the with a guest story of a memorable hunt that they have it could be the you know about the one that got away or or you know a great harvest or just a or just a great memory that you made in the uh, in the whitetail woods but uh if you wouldn't mind go ahead and give us one of your uh one of your favorite stories and give us uh every detail from the uh from the truck back to the tailgate and tell us where you're hunting well uh let me think last year actually we had a really cool hunt um it wasn't even it wasn't a buck that i killed it was a buddy of mine, Zach Farnball, who actually works. He's one of our full-time employees here at Midwest Whitetail. I, uh, we went out to a piece of public land that we previously scouted. We had to canoe into it to get way back in there. Um, we checked a camera, saw that there was a number of mature bucks using the area. All of them were, were uh, nocturnal on the camera or at night on the camera, but we kind of knew where the bedding area was, so... Zach and I put the canoe in, paddled up about a mile to get in there, went in, hung the stand in the tree that we'd previously picked, and I think this was October 15th, and this would have been last year, and I was filming Zach that night. We saw a pile of deer, and right at last light, just how we drew it up, a uh, big mature buck came out of the bedding area and right up underneath the stand, and, and Zach, Zach uh, shot him at 10 yards, and... 
we thought it was a perfect hit. We actually thought we, I, I thought that I'd film the deer go down in the field. So me and Zach are high fiving, you know, up in the tree, and we're <laughs> losing losing everything up there, dropping the um, quivers and arrows, and you know how it goes. When you right after you shoot a big buck, you, right. you sort of uh, just forget where you are for a few minutes. Yeah, you unravel <laughs> a little bit. It's all right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And uh, eventually, we got down out of the tree and went out there looking for that deer. We couldn't find him. And uh, long story short. We ended up uh, going to town and getting our buddy, Michael Parente, who was interning for us last year at the time. And we came out and we spent, I think, 16 hours straight tracking that deer through the middle of the night. Wow. And uh, it ended up being a, a one lung liver gut hit that we thought was a double lung hit. And that just goes to show you, don't ever assume anything on an archery hit whitetail. Right. But uh, anyway, long story short, we ended up tracking that deer all night long and then most of the morning on our hands and knees and pen drops out there <laughs> and it was just uh it was a it was a good experience with uh some of my very good friends that uh that you can't you know that you're gonna kill big deer in your life at some point most folks that do this seriously will but um those are the those are the memories where you're out there with your buddies and you're learn you're all learning as a group that are that are the best ones. And I don't even remember what Zach's buck scores. I don't really care. But we we as a group tracked that deer um through there and through some pretty incredible stuff. I mean at times we were we were looking for little broken twigs and uh, you know, spots where where the deer might have rushed against a tree and maybe left a piece of hair there. I mean, there was hardly any blood for the last 150 yards of the track job. Right. So we were starting to question our sanity a little bit <laughs> 10, 10 a.m. the next morning after we'd been out there all night long right? with uh, no food, no sleep, no nothing. But uh, about that time, we looked up and there he laid, and we were, we were pretty ecstatic at that point because we'd been out there so long and definitely glad to, glad to get the buck. But that was... That was one of my more recent memorable stories that uh, that we've had here, and that you can actually watch that hunt. I think it was on Midwest Whitetail last year. I was gonna say, I think I, I think I actually watched that one, but it's it's funny that you mentioned about you know how you spending time with your buddies, learning you know learning new things together and stuff like that. I think sometimes you know we as hunters we often forget that that you know moment of truth per se is really just you know a fleeting moment. And it's all those other hours that we spend putting work in with, you know, whether it's our buddies or our family or whatever to get after it are the parts that you really kind of remember that, you know, that trigger release is just but a second and uh, it's everything leading up to and after. I think that has the most impact and I think that's uh, something important to remember. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. But uh, so before uh, before I let you get going here, I just want to make sure that we uh, make make a shout out to let folks know where they can learn more about you and learn more about Midwest Whitetail. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, just you know, where can they find more information and and, uh, and uh, your social platforms and so forth? Uh, yeah, anything Midwest Whitetail, um, I'm on it. Uh, the Whitetail Watch website is a great um, tool as well. That's one of our sister sites to Midwest Whitetail. It's kind of an interactive platform for deer hunters where they can get on, they can ask questions, they can post success photos and that sort of thing. And myself, Bill, and the other guys in the office, we're always on there um, talking to folks and uh, discussing hunting stories and strategies and so on and so forth. And then, uh, like we'd mentioned earlier, the public land section of the site is where myself and the other office guys spend a lot of their time. And that's a, that's a video blog section of the, the website that uh, we've constantly got updates on we just actually finished editing one from yesterday's hunt earlier today so uh, we'll have more of those coming up here in the next few weeks and even into the off season we'll we'll probably dive into more of these scouting tips and strategies and things that i was discussing earlier in the podcast on that blog and then on the midwest whitetail main show as well so nice well, yeah, absolutely. Anyone who, out there who hasn't been to the Midwest Whitetail, uh, the plethora of sites and, and so forth, do yourself a favor and, and check it out. If you have not yet, there's all kinds of information there. It's it's literally an education online of 
of mature whitetail hunting and uh i find myself gravitating there just about daily so uh you get plenty of traffic from uh from the philadelphia pennsylvania area um if you if you check your google analytics uh, but Good aaron deal. i, w- <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on man i appreciate you spending some some time with me i want to let you get going so you can get back i know you probably have some editing to do or something this evening related to uh to, to midwest whitetail so i'll let you get going but i do want to say thank you for hopping on and, and talking deer with me no problem at all i enjoyed it i love talking about this stuff all right, man. We'll talk again soon. I appreciate your time. Yep. Sounds good. We'll see you. All right. That is a wrap for today's show, folks. We'd just like to thank Aaron for joining us. Uh, be sure to head to MidwestWhitetail.com and check out all of their content. And be sure to also give them a follow on all their social media platforms, particularly YouTube. All their video content that they put out, for the most part, you can find there. And it's a great place to go find some quick tips, uh, no matter what type of hunting you're getting into. You can, of course, find all the uh, requisite links to any of their social pages in their website in the blog post show notes. Also, want to make sure we thank our partners at Exodus Outdoor Gear. And of course, I want to thank all of you for tuning in. If you are liking what you're hearing, please feel free to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, and you can also listen to us on Google Play. Uh, and until next time, we'll see y'all.